Welcome to this episode of Religion and American Life, a podcast of the Blasey Center for Religion and American Public Life at Boston College. I am Mark Massa, and I have the happy privilege of being director of the Blasey Center, and I will serve as today's hosts. This podcast is the newest initiative in the Blasey Center's commitment to connecting a community of scholars, policymakers, media, and religious leaders in conversation and scholarly reflection around issues at the intersection of religion and American public life. Today, we are privileged to be joined by theology and law professor M. Kathleen Caveney at Boston College to discuss the theological and legal implications of both the Supreme Court leak regarding Roe v. Wade and also the implications of the Supreme Court's forthcoming decision about Roe versus Wade. Kathy is the Daryl and Juliet Libby Professor here at Boston College, a position that includes appointments in both the Department of Theology and in BC's law school. She received her JD from Yale University, after which she clerked for Judge John Noonan Jr. in the Ninth Circuit and worked as an associated member of Boston's Ropes and Gray Law Firm. She received her PhD also from Yale and now focuses her research on the relationship of law, religion, and morality. While her articles and essays are much too numerous to quote, she has, Kathy has a quite impressive uh, bibliography of works, and I'm not going to name those, but I would just name her most recent books, which include A Culture of Engagement, Law, Religion, and Morality, published by Georgetown University Press, Prophecy Without Contempt, Religious D Discourse in the Public Square, published by Harvard, and Ethics at the Edges of Law, Christian Moralists and American Legal Thought, published by Oxford. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you for joining us. I'm delighted. We have a bunch of things to talk about today about the Supreme Court and its forthcoming decision regarding the, stat, the legal status of Roe v. Wade as a precedent. So I guess I want to start by just asking you, who do you think leaked this opinion ahead of time? As you know, you, you know better than I, there's much speculation in the blogosphere of whether it came from the right or the left. Who do you think leaked this? Well, I have absolutely no inside information. So I feel like in a way somebody, you know, following along with a television mystery. But if I had to put a bet on this I, without any knowledge, um, my approach would be looking at it in terms of qui bono, who's good, you know, is served by this. So I don't think it was to the good of the left because, you know, I, I, you know, the idea that it would be somebody on the left would be that, well, once they see how upset a segment of the American population is, they'll change the, the opinion. And my response to that is that's not the way the justices that signed on to this opinion or that could be expected to sign on to the opinion work. It isn't a question for them of popular pressure, it's a question of you know, what they think the Constitution demands, and they fully expect this to be a, a divisive opinion. So I don't think it was the left. I actually think that it was a member of, the, you know, more of the right wing of the court that, that, that leaked this. And here's my reasoning. I, I think it was leaked to put pressure on Chief Justice John Roberts, because if he goes with the, the majority, it'll be a 6-3 opinion. And it'll, that's a very solid opinion. If he doesn't, it's a 5-4 opinion. And that's, you know, it's still law, it still counts, it still governs, but it's a lot shakier, at least from a political point of view. And I don't mean politics as in left, right, but as in the polis, then the court really looks like, well, you've got three justices, you know, who were all just recently appointed by Trump. And, the, you know, and they're joining with two of the more right-wing justices and they're overturning an opinion that's been around for half a century. So that doesn't look as good. Now, why would Roberts join it? Well, as I read the Alito opinion, it, it, it is, you know, rhetorically quite aggressive toward those who have a different view on abortion or abortion and constitutional rights. It, it, it's, it's inflammatory, in my view, not simply 
overturning the law. It, 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 I think it conveys at some points disdain for people who disagree with him, you know, and that can erode the respect for the court. So I think Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, who is very concerned with the institution, might think about joining the majority, making a 6-3 opinion, but then also as the Chief Justice getting to assign the opinion, which would mean not to Alito necessarily, probably not to Alito, but maybe even to himself to write a more tempered and possibly even narrower opinion. You could uphold Roe v. Wade as it's applied to the particular case and and then but but got the broader legal framework that was in the opinion. Let me go back to something you just said, which is very interesting. And not being a lawyer, I didn't understand. Why is it important to note whether the final decision is six to three or five to four? Like why explain explain why that's an important distinction. It's only one vote. Right. But six to three, I mean, at first, let me just state, you know, absolutely, it doesn't affect the, you know, the legal outcome. Five to four is a majority. And if you get a majority to sign on the opinion, it's the opinion of the court, period. But a five to four decision is as is divided as you can get. And it really looks like that, you know, you know, that it's sort of one president, Donald Trump, who kind of made the difference. And then when you think back to the, you know, the the refusal of McConnell to confirm Merrick Garland when there was still quite a bit of time left, and then his subsequent pushing through of Amy Coney Barrett under much less time, it it calls in, it makes the court looks like something that is simply a tool of partisan politics. And it's still sitting on as close a knife edge as you could get. A 6-3 decision is more solid. It's, it sort of says, this is where we are now, folks. It, it looks more settled. So legally, it doesn't have any effect. But from the perspective of stability, I think it has a lot. Let me ask you about the leak, because you're a respected commentator on law and morality. How much damage did, has this leak done to the reputation of the Supreme Court, do you think, among legal scholars and or Americans? I think, well, I mean, I think it's done quite a lot because, you know, the Supreme Court, you know, is made up of men and women, but in a, in a way, they're almost like priests, right? They're the high secular priests of our society. And, you know, they wear the black robes, they kind of hide their individuality, they don't go out in public and give their views on baking and everything that relates to the, you know, to the whole world, right? Right. So um, I think that this is sort of drawing back the curtain. It's like exposing the Wizard of Oz, too. You know, once you know how all of this is done, it's... So you're saying, so you're saying it, it's just exposing how the sausage is made, then? It's exposing how the sausage is made, and it's exposing that, you know, there's quite a lot of tension, I think, in the court and division about what the job is. Now, one of the things that concerns me is that if we read the tea leaves correctly, all the people who are going to be voting in favor of overturning Roe v. Wade are Roman Catholic or raised as Roman Catholics. What's going to be the pushback on that in terms of the perception of this being a Catholic decision or a Catholic vote? I think there's going to be substantial pushback. And I think we can talk about that because, you know, you are, you know, such an esteemed historian of American religious history, and you know the history of anti-Catholicism in the country. But, you know, here is, I think, kind of the, the problem. You know, it, it, it's almost sectarian in a sense, right? Like, if you think of a sect as, you know, not necessarily right or wrong, but if only one clearly identifiable group in the country has a view of what the law should be. And even if they claim it's the moral law and not some religious law, you know, it, it's going to look suspicious to some people because there are a lot of religious denominations that do not have the same view of, of, of abortion. Now, what Alito and those people might say is, you know, we're not regulating on abortion, we're returning it to the states. But some of the states to whom it's been returned are you know, not just saying, well, we're just going to regulate our people. There's going to be a movement 
to kind of control abortion, I think, out of its borders as much as some of these states can. So would you say that if if the people who would be critical of such an overturning of Roe v. Wade, if they were to see this as a Catholic sectarian decision, that's not too far off the mark? Is that what you're saying? Well, I think it's off the mark in some ways and not off the mark on the in the others. I think it's true that it's it's undeniable that the people who, you know, would go with this decision were were Catholic or raised Catholic. I mean, you, you can't deny that. But Catholics have themselves a more pluralistic view of, of abortion. It's not like, you know, all Catholics are in lockstep behind the Pope on abortion or homosexuality or any other issue. Justice Sotomayor was was raised Catholic and she's on the other side. So I would like to see, you know, a pointing out of, you know, the different views of Catholics, not, you know, not simply, well, this is all one thing. I mean, I think it's much easier to say they're all a creature of the Federalist Society than they're all a creature of the Catholic Church, because what's what's doing the job, I think, is a certain view of constitutional interpretation that was prompted by outrage at Roe, but, you know, has been signed on to by other people and not signed on to others. Ironically, I think it's a Protestant view of, of textual interpretation, not right. a Catholic. Te- well, te- we can talk about textualism in a minute. But it's, as you know, I've written a lot about anti-Catholicism. My fear, as soon as this was leaked, is this is going to give rise to a new kind of anti-Catholicism. And my it's, it's based on this. All six do not share the same understanding of natural law. But for many of them, there's an understanding of natural law that's a distinctly Catholic approach to understanding the real world that is a Catholic understanding of natural law. And that's my fear. Am am I wrong in perceiving that? No, I I think you're you're quite right. I I, I mean, I I think that there are other ways of interpreting natural law. I think abortion, even in the tradition, is a more complicated issue than some people are willing to give it, give credence to. But you're right. Um, And where where the nub is, is there's this, heads I win, tails you lose approach to this. So uh, uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor, when you know some evangelical Protestants were asking for a religiously based exemption to the contraceptive mandate or to the mandate to cover abortifacient concept, uh, contraceptives from their view, they said, oh, well, I can't do this. This is my sincere religious belief. It's a religious belief. And you have to protect it, you know, under the free exercise clause. Well, now, you know, what comes into play is the establishment clause. And so when people say, hey, you're kind of establishing Catholic, you know, notions of natural law with this kind of uh, approach. And yeah, isn't it interesting? You're all pretty conservative Catholics or raised Catholic. And people will say, oh, no, it's not religious reasoning at all. It's just, you know, our, you know, uh, the interpretation of the objective natural law, which applies to everybody by virtue of reason. But the little piece in there that I think causes the problem is that within Catholic thought, or at least a certain strand of Catholic thought, Catholics in the magisterium are have a privileged interpretation of the natural law. Revelation and the magisterium can tell you what it is in hard cases. And I think there's a little of that going on. Right. See, the, the thing is that, as you know, I've written a lot on natural law and its critics. And it seems to me that the reason that I'm reading this is a Catholic understanding of natural law is in the older neo-scholastic, and for those of you who aren't trained in neo-scholastic natural law, which is about 99% of our listeners, the older neo-scholastic Catholic natural law, which under which undergirded Catholic teaching on sexuality, it basically said the end of the act determines its goodness or badness. Right. So if you can determine what the purpose of an act is, and anything that stymies or blocks achieving that end is wrong. So to the question of what is the end of human sexuality, the Catholic answer was procreation. Right. So the Catholic answer in theology was anything that keeps procreation from happening is intrinsically disordered. So what does that include? Abortion, obviously, birth control, obviously, homosexual acts, things like that. So in other words, all those are intrinsically disordered because they frustrate the end of the act. So my fear is that if they can do this to Roe v. Wade, is this going to suddenly affect other things like birth control and gay marriage and all that other stuff? Before we 
we get there, I want to turn the tables and ask you, is this anti-Catholicism, Mark, in a, in a moral sense, or is this a legitimate fear of people who are judges not taking seriously the common good? You know, because you can use anti-Catholicism in a couple of ways. When one can be, this is an illicit prejudice against a group of people, and another could be, these Catholics, these particular Catholics are doing something that is actually harming a pluralistic common good. Full disclosure, Kathy and I talk about these things almost every day. So this is not, this is, for the two of us, this is not a new conversation. We're simply reprising something we talk about all the time. My sense is that not all criticism of the church is anti-Catholicism, obviously. And I've criticized the church for, I'm, I'm a Catholic priest. I don't think I'm anti-Catholic, but I'm also critical of a lot of the Catholic positions and the stances that the church has made on things. But my fear is that what could be easily perceived and maybe is the case is that these five or six judges, depending on what the final vote is, are using a very, from my point of view, dated understanding of natural law, of a, a distinctly Catholic kind of natural law, to make a decision that affects everyone, not just Catholics, but people who are not, not Catholic, not Christian, not religious. And the question is, there's another part of Catholic teaching called the common good, which is part of, undergirds the Catholic social teaching tradition. What does that do to the, the idea of the common good to have... a a bunch of Catholics make a decision that affects people who aren't Catholics, who don't have that understanding of natural law. That's my fear. I don't think that's an anti-Catholic fear. I think that's a quite legitimate fear. I mean, do you think most Catholic theologians would agree with that? I don't know. I, I think a lot of them would. I mean, some obviously wouldn't, but I, I, I think really what it's about is more like not just a theory of theology or natural law, but the relationship of good law to kind of the common morality. I mean, that's really what's at stake. I think there's a lot of people on the right who think an act of law is kind of like an act of magic, almost like we're going to prohibit it and it's all going to go away. We've got the law. It's, you know, everybody's going to obey it. It'll be fine. We'll tidy up the world. But even if you read St. Thomas Aquinas, even, you know, and you can't get more Catholic than St. Thomas Aquinas, <laughs> you know, he recognizes that law can't be too out of step with the morality of the whole people, um, or it's going to end up backfiring. You can't put, you know, too strong wine or new wine into old wineskins. And he talks about, you know, blowing your nose and it's going to bleed. And so I, I think some of these people don't take that seriously. As you know, better than I, as a lawyer, part of the Roe v. Wade decision was based upon the court's sense of a right to privacy. Right. That that individuals have a right to privacy that isn't explicitly named as such in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, but it's part of its implications. What would the decision of overturning Roe v. Wade do to that understanding of the right to privacy? Well, I think it would really threaten it, or it could really threaten it. The right to privacy, you know, is not specified in the Constitution, but it's pulled together out of various aspects of the prohibition against search and seizure, 14th Amendment. So for people who have a certain developmental view of the Constitution, that's fine because the Constitution isn't confined just to its word. There is normative implications about viewing it together, and one of them was the right to privacy. For the people on the right who are either strict constructionalists or a textualist and the line and all of that is sort of uh, blurry, th they tend to focus on what's actually in the text. And the fact that no right to abortion or right to privacy is mentioned is, you know, would be decisive. And you can see that in Alito's opinion. So what is the right to privacy as it would be affected here? So you had, you know, it first came out with Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965, which protected the right of married couples to use contraception. Then later, uh, I think it's Eisenstadt versus Baird, it was 19, I think 72, but it protected the right of unmarried people to buy contraception. And then it turned into Roe v. Wade. And over time, we've had a debate about what the you know, right to privacy includes or doesn't include. They resisted the extension of the right to privacy to a right to assisted suicide in Washington versus Glucksburg, which was an important case. But where it was sort of extended was in, you know, Obergefell, the case that gave constitutional protection to same-sex marriage. 
Now, I think that that is at least theoretically at risk. And, you know, it, it's not clear to me, for example, you know, how the criteria for finding a, a 14th Amendment right that, that the court is using in this opinion can square with, with pr- protecting same-sex marriage, because they say it has to be right deeply rooted in this nation's traditions. Well, you know, same-sex marriage at the at the time of the following, you know, the, the the writing of the Constitution, you know, in the framers was not a possibility. And in fact, you know, it was one of the it involved one of the sexual acts that was condemned. So I think that that's a serious possibility. Now, they I think you could go after contraception as well. They say, oh, we don't mean to do that. But I'm like, why? Is it just your fiat then? You know, Right. So we get back to the sectarian question again. Do you think it's likely that if it is overturned, and we're talking speculatively here, obviously, if it is overturned, do you think they're like the justices will likely talk about the right to privacy in their decision, or will they avoid that? That's, I think some of them will talk about it and some of them will avoid it. I think Alito sort of says, well, Alito's trying to come up with a distinction where he says, well, those earlier rights to privacy, protecting contraception, they're different from abortion because abortion involves, you know, the taking of a human life. And so they are separated. That doesn't make any sense to me, you know, in terms of what whether the right to privacy exists or not. It might go to whether the right to privacy deals with abortion. But, you know, the, the test that he's using is the test that was used in Glusberg. Is this, you know, a narrowly tailored right? And is it deeply rooted in our nation's history and traditions? And that cuts against contraception, that cuts against gay marriage, as well as abortion. So where, if it is, if Roe v. Wade is overturned, where is that likely to go? What will happen? Let's let's say speculatively, the vote is five to four, or maybe more likely six to three to overturn Roe v. Wade. What happens then? Well, that's a very good question. Some people were saying, oh, well, it's just going to return the matter. And this is a little bit in Alito's opinion as well, um, to the states. The states can, you know, we're, we're short-circuited from an orderly process of updating abortion laws by Roe. And that kind of threw the whole issue into culture war. And then once we get rid of Roe, we will just democratically work all of that out. I, I, I have serious doubts about that because there are 50 years of water under the bridge and a lot of them have waves of culture war in that water. So I, I think it's going to be very difficult. I think some states, and we've seen some evidence of this in Missouri, are going to try to stop people from crossing borders to get abortions. I think, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't even be surprised. People think, um, you know, a little bit too dire on this would be, you know, pregnancy tests of women of childbearing age or getting on planes before and after. And, you know, I was on a panel once with a professor, so well, there's the right to travel. Well, yeah, there is a right to travel, but the right to travel doesn't include, you know, taking persons across uh, state lines to kill them. There's a limit to the right to travel. And so the question is, if the state thinks, you know, the unborn is a person, and then it has a compelling state interest in figuring out where the person who is not doesn't have a birth certificate is located, right? If the Supreme Court does overturn it, is the most likely scenario then that they'll remand it to the states to decide individually? Is that, or is there another alternative to that? Well, if they overturn the whole thing, then, I mean, this view of constitutional interpretation says the Constitution says nothing about abortion. States can regulate it however they wish. You know, it's it's a matter of democratic uh, decision making on the part of each state. So you're going to end up with a patchwork of different states. And, you know, where we live, it'll be legal. And Texas and Alabama, the South, it won't be. So it'll be something of that sort. I think there are some in the pro-life movement. And the minute that Roe is overturned, this is, I think, going to be the direction they go in to say it's not simply that the Constitution doesn't say anything about abortion. In fact, a proper interpretation of the Constitution says that abortion is, is wrong because it, you know, the, the, you should view the fetus as a person under the 14th Amendment, and therefore the state has to protect it. So this isn't going to end the abortion debate. It's going to shift the, the ground on which it's conducted. Do you think that Chief Justice Roberts is going to try to shape the decision as narrowly as possible or what? What do you think his role will be in this 
decision? Well, in order to shape the decision as narrowly as possible, he has to join the majority and probably write the opinion himself. And do I think he will do that? I hope he will do that. I mean, I don't agree with him on a lot of things, but I do believe he has the institutional interest of the court at stake as a body that has a certain function. And I think that really has been undermined by groups like the Federalist Society and Trump and kind of saying, wink, wink, nod, nod, Here, here's what these people are going to do. And if you vote for me, you'll get the law you want. And, and I think that's a very bad thing. G- give me an example. What would a narrowly defined decision look like? So how could Robert shape it in a way that would be very narrowly defined? Well, I think what he could do is sort of say, we uphold Roe or the holding in Roe, but you could extend Casey and rather than overrule Roe and Casey and say, there are certain lines that are protected by, by Roe, um, but the undue burden standard that, you know, that we had in Roe was not sufficiently sensitive to the need uh, to balance the fetal life and the mother's interests. And so we're going to permit, say, more regulation of abortion, really, even after the first trimester. So exception. So so a narrowly defined decision would include some exception. I think that from my perspective, I, I, I mean, I think that would be a much more stable thing, um, because if you said, look, there are, you know, in this culture, in this society, forcing a woman to continue a pregnancy that threatens her life you know, is, is beyond the pale, but we allow different sorts of balances. And, and, and I, here I think that is where the, the problem with the, the pro-life movement comes in. It's one thing to say, we believe in the humanity of the unborn. You know, that's one thing, and that's kind of a Catholic commitment to, you know, the value of all life. But where the pro-life movement has also gone is to say, and the uh, act of abortion is only considered as intentional killing, which intentional killing of the innocent is not permitted, as you know, in Catholic moral thought. But abortion is a very different thing, right? Because it's not only describable as an intentional killing, it's also describable as a refusal to provide bodily life support. And there really is no other situation in which not killing somebody means providing a significant amount of body life, of bodily life support of, you know, going through a significantly painful birth. So I think you can kind of look at the issue both ways and say, well, there are certain circumstances where not carrying the baby to term doesn't count as intentional killing. And that's where I think the casuistry needs to go on this. If you, if, if Roe is overturned, this is different than just going back to 1973. Right. Why is that so? Because we've had, we've really had 50 years of culture wars. I mean, the issue is framed now. So you've got extremism on both sides, right? And in American people are kind of in the muddled middle. I mean, all the polls show very little change in people's views over abortion over the past 50 years. You know, people are kind of stable and they're a little muddled in a sense. They, they, they I want to call themselves pro-life, um, but they also call themselves pro-choice. They don't want abortion illegal, but um, they don't want it to happen either. So I I think that the American view on this is not the view of either the pro-life activists or the pro-choice activists. And so it would not be going back to 1973 because we have 50 years of other arguments. And we have 50 years of culture wars where the arguments are set by the activists on either side who view it as a culture war and view the other side as morally benighted, not making a different decision about a very hard case. And I think you see that in Alito's opinion. I mean, I think the reason it's so pleasing to so many people on the right and so upsetting to so many people on the left isn't just what it decides, but it's the the way the issue is framed. What's likely to happen socially if it's overturned, even if it's remanded? Let's say the court does remand it to the states, and every state will have a somewhat different understanding of the right to abortion or the right not to have an abortion. So socially, what what is the women's movement and groups on the left likely to do with this? Well, I think it's sort of interesting. I'm not sure what will actually happen 
once we, we, we go back on the ground, because, you know, the statistics still say that one out of three women have an abortion. That's a lot of people. And, and that means there are a lot of people that know people. So it's one thing to sort of say, well, you know, I'm pro-life in the abstract, right? I don't know how many people are pro-life when it comes to actually voting on this in ways that affect people they know. I think it'll be interesting to see if the pro-life states are as pro-life as they claim to be. So your your answer is this is culturally not going to solve anything. Whatever they decide, this is not going to solve the cultural debate that's been going on for 50 years. No, it's not going to solve it. You know, I, I, I sometimes fear it's going to be another nail in the coffin of intellectual Catholic participation in, in the life of of, of, of the country. I mean, you know, we all know that the Baptist, well, you know this better, you know, the Scopes trial really called into question the, the, the legitimacy of fundamentalist and Baptist. You're exactly right, because in point of fact, most evangelical Protestants were not in favor of the Scopes trial. It's kind of hard to overestimate how much damage the monkey trial did to the perception of evangelicals among, say, university people or among the college educated so you're saying this could have the same effect on Catholic intellectual life? I, I think so. I mean, I, what frustrates me is that you know, if you read the New York Times commentators on law, you know, they do identify Catholicism with this. It fits a certain stereotype, right? You know, pugnacious, good debaters, and obsessed with sex. Not not completely off the mark, we might say. But well, so. well, there are certainly, I can certainly name some. Um, I'm not going to do that because I'm trying to be charitable, which is the greatest of all the theological virtues. But I think it's going to be a problem because if this goes through and kind of dismantles the idea of Catholics as, you know, not trying to impose their view um, as really, you know, common citizens with other people. And again, it's it really is as much the tone they take as the, the actual decision. So I hope I'd like to encourage Justice Roberts to write the opinion himself. Also, what you just said about the fear of what effect this would have on Catholic intellectual life, it does go toward explaining the fact that I've been really surprised at the silence of the bishops in this. You would think that this is something that at least some of the bishops have been campaigning for so vigorously and loudly. And there's been a deafening silence since the leak. So your reading would be they're afraid of the very thing you just elucidated? That would be one reading, or they're trying not to jinx it, I suppose, would be another one. Or, you know, you've got Archbishop of San Francisco now telling Speaker Pelosi that she can't receive communion. So I think there are some, but there haven't been a whole lot of bishops that jumped on that bandwagon either. So So you think the bishops share this deep concern about a possible provocation of anti-Catholic feeling or of, or of the perception of Catholics of being maybe even sectarian? I don't know if they would articulate it in that way, but I, you know, like I've got to, I'm not going to say anything because I'm concerned about this, but I think it, it's at least an inchoate fear in some of them that's calling them to restrain. Well, Kathy, I want to thank you. You're a very busy woman these days, and I want to thank you for our conversation. Uh, we have a common friend who always says that Kathy Caveney is the smartest person he knows. And so, so thank you all. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, especially Kathy, for your remarks today. And you'll be able to obviously listen to this podcast as well as the other podcasts at the Boise Center website. So thanks for listening in, folks. And we'll be back with another podcast very soon. Thank you for listening to Religion and American Life, a podcast by the Boise Center for Religion and American Public Life at Boston College. For more information on the work of the Boise Center, the Center's schedule of events, or to listen to other episodes of this podcast, please visit our website at bc.edu slash boise.